We're here today on March 1st, 2023 at the Bruce R. Watkins Cultural Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And we have the great privilege of talking with Mr. Alvin Brooks today. And Alvin, thank you for uh, being with us today. We really appreciate this opportunity to visit with you. My pleasure to join you. Thank you. Great. You know, um, well, uh, we'll just start at the beginning. I, I know that uh, you originated in Arkansas. Could you talk a little bit about your origin story, and um, uh, then we'll talk about how you came up to Kansas City. But uh, what was it like in Arkansas? Well, I wasn't old enough to know. Um, my uh, mother, Thomasine Gilder, at age 14, gave birth to me in the home of uh, Cluster and Estelle Brooks who eventually adopted me. My mother had uh, got pregnant by my father, Wilbur Lamar Herring, in Miami, Florida. And of course, uh, at that time, when, you, when a girl got pregnant out of wedlock, uh, they sent her away to live with a, an older relative. And my mother went to live with her elder sister in North Little Rock, Arkansas, Pulaski County, who lived right across the road from the Brookses. And so, her brother-in-law, my mother's brother-in-law, of course they were adults, had some problem with the teenage pregnant person being in, in his home, and so my aunt um, went over to the Brookses and asked if my mother could stay there until I was born. And after I was born, my mother stayed there for several months and then decided that she wanted to finish high school and go back to Miami, Florida, where the Gilders family of all seven of the children and, and that of the Ritz was in, in Miami, Florida and left me with the Brookses and the Brookses uh, adopted me. And I didn't know I was adopted until I was 22 years old when, when uh, Thomas St. Gilder began to communicate with me. Thomas St. Gilder Davis, she was married to Jimmy Davis and lived in San Francisco. And we began to write letters and whatever and eventually uh, came to Kansas City to visit me over the Christmas holiday in 1954. I was in the police academy, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how that we connected, reconnected, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you, uh, your family, that is the Brooks family, your adoptive family, decided to move to Kansas City. What uh, uh, is the reason why they came to Kansas City? Yeah, I mean, well, my uh, Cluster Brooks, my my adopted father, killed a white man over a moonshine still. And the word was that uh, Brooks had the best uh, moonshine in Pulaski County. He knew on the on the scene of moonshine, being a moonshiner. And um, the older white man, who also was known in the community, um, began to lose his customers to my father. And he had had the word out that he's going to put that in out one way or the other and he used the word, in. And so he uh, uh, came over, it was a Sunday, my, my mother and my father told the story. And I was in Kansas City at the time I overheard this, about 13 or 14 years old. Mm -hmm. and happened to be sitting on the front porch of uh, my uh, father's sister here in Kansas City, Missouri, when they told the story that, that one Sunday morning, and my mother was in the Estelle Brooks, and I will be referring to my mother. I won't. Say, I don't. I don't like to use the term adopted parents. So I hope that that the the viewers and the listeners and you you read the book, my book, buying us together. Well, because I, I don't like to make that distinction because the Brookses raised me and 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 were my family. And although I love my biological parents, I met with both of them and we became very close. But the Brookses were my, my parents who, who made me what I am. Thank you. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, my, my uh, cluster Brooks killed the white man over the steel. This particular Sunday morning, um, my mother said that um, she, this truck drove up on their property and in North Little Rock, Arkansas. And the gentleman got out, who was white, and he began to curse. And he apparently he knew where my father still was. My dad was kind of sure he built the still back from the house and it was, I don't know whether the viewers or you know what thickets are, but that's a lot of vines and things growing together. And he, he was very 
um, industrious in how he built the steel. He had where he had the stovepipes running up from the steel so that when the wind changed, he could turn the pipe and it'd go the opposite direction so you couldn't smell it from the road. And so the fellow was there, he had a, a pump shotgun. And he was walking towards this and he was calling my dad all kind of names and this kind of thing. And he was pumping sh uh, shells and shooting. Well, those pellets would hit that, those vines and just bounce off like it was steel. My dad had a 44 Winchester lever action. I think it's 1853 model, one that you, the lever action. And my dad always kept it back there. And he told me, you own my property? I'm going to shoot you if you don't, don't, don't come any further. And the fellow in advance, my dad shot him and killed him. And my mother was holding me, she said, on the back porch in her arms when the man was just even at the truck and all was right there. So, of course, there were dozens of so men there drinking and telling their usual kind of men lies to each other, fishing and women, everything like that, but half of them disappeared. But one of them in particular asked my mother, you want me to, I asked my dad, you want me to call the sheriff? He said yes. So we didn't have a phone, so he left and pretty soon the sheriff came. Now, the word is that my dad had the sheriff and the judge on his payroll. And of course, he was, in spite of all of that, you know, it's, this was, this was a, a shooting, a death of a white man in, in Arkansas in, in 1933. And so, um, they took my dad to jail. Uh, the dad had taken the gun in the house, and the sheriff said, "Go, uh, cluster, go get the gun." And he put in. They put my dad in the back seat. There was another white man with the sheriff, and it was never known whether he was a deputy sheriff or who he was, just riding with the sheriff. And my dad got in the back seat with with his gun and, and all, and took him to jail. Well, one of the men who had made the call and come back, waiting for the sheriff with my dad and all. Uh, asked my mother, you want me to go down in the morning, Miss Brooks, to find out what and she said, well, I'm going down. So my, my mom, that Monday morning, goes down, one of the times, of course, segregation at the Pulaski County Courthouse, and uh, she wanted to see, to talk to the judge. The sheriff said, what are you doing? He said, I want to talk to the judge about, about the cluster. He said, girl, you can't, you can't, you can't go and you can't see the judge. You can't see the judge. He said, I know what cluster's got going on with me and the judge, but you can't see the judge. So, she he said, so you know you'll go back home. So she has, she started to go back. The judge was breaking for lunch, and so she goes up and confronts the judge, and the sheriff has stepped back from there, and then the sheriff came up and said, I told you, girl, you can't. The sheriff said, what do you want, girl? And he, he said, she said, my husband is clustered. Well, she was holding me in her arms, and she said, whose baby is that? And he said, whose boy is that? And he said, that's my boy. She said, ain't you white? She said, she said, no, sir, I'm calling. She said, you white. So she said, sheriff. Sheriff, I uh, called him by his name. And she, could she call it a white? He said, she's colored. So my, my, my uh, the sheriff said, come on. I mean, the judge said, come on in. So they sat at the table, not on the bench, but at the table. And uh, but, but before that, she got to see my, my I'm, I'm ahead of myself. She got to see my, my dad in jail. And my dad said, uh, listen, I, we need to get out of here. What I'd like for you to do is, you know, you, you know, I collect all those roots on the back porch. I want you to go and get a piece of John the Conqueror root. John the Conqueror root. He, he said, you know what that she said, yeah. He said, I want you to go to that, pinch off a piece and wash it off. And I want you to come back and put it in your mouth. I want you to sit next to the judge and spit on the judge. She said, you got to be crazy. He said, what's going to happen to our baby? I'll be in there with you. What's going to happen to our baby? She said, just do what I said. Just do what I said. So she goes, goes back now, after seeing my dad, goes back home and, and gets this kind of conqueror. And she said she had it in her hand. And so she came back and then at that time the sheriff asked her, what are you doing back here? He said, well, I need to see the, ju the judge. She said, well, you already seen Cluster, you, you can't know. She said, I got to see the judge, you can't see him. He said, you're going back home. Well, that's when the break for lunch and all and she had to say. So when she, the judge told her, come on, he sat at the table. So she sat with her knee to his knee, and I was sitting on her lap. And while she was walking down behind the judge, she put this down the concrete in her mouth. And she said her, her hands were all sweaty and brown because she was so scared. And so she said they sat there. And about that time, she, she faked a sneeze. She said saliva went all over the judge, all over her, and all over me. And the judge had on a white shirt 
and it must have been time year he didn't have a coat on, just a short thing, short thing, white shirt. And he kept doing this, getting all the brown off, and he wondered what that was. He said, well, what is it you want? And, and uh, she said, I want to spend with you not tell you, I can, I can, my husband's going to get out. She said, you going back home. She said, I want you to know now that an that, uh, that end has killed a white man in Arkansas, and that's death. You understand that? She said, yes, Your Honor, sir. So she goes back home. And um, uh, but the, and so she said she had to urinate so bad, she, and she couldn't do it there at the courthouse. So finally, she made it home. Had outdoor toilet at home. She set me on the steps and went to use the toilet outside. And when she got in the house, my dad was already there. She said, "What did you do? Escape? What did you do?" She said, "No, you know." He said, "But I got into Saturday to get out of town. We got into Saturday, so packing things up, old uh, car didn't have a first gear on it." Had to back up many of the hills in the Ozark coming up from Arkansas to Missouri. And that's how we got to Kansas City, Missouri. Wow, that is quite a story. And so he was never charged. And um, so what an interesting time in the 1930s that a black man killed a white man in the South yeah. or anywhere. I think and that wouldn't have happened except for the fact that the judge and the sheriff were both uh, making some profit off that stuff. Oh, yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah. And they, and they knew it was, was self-defense. And, they, and uh, they had just good justification, I guess, if the white community rose up and said, well, a uh, black man killed the white man and you didn't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's quite a story. Now, when um, your family uh, came to Kansas City and uh, settled, whereabouts did they settle? Well, my, we, we moved in with my dad's uh, sister, Matilda, uh, no, I'm sorry, not Matilda, I'm getting my, my aunts mixed up, um, Mitty McDonald, Mitty McDonald, M-I-T-T-I-E McDonald. And her husband was a burglar uh, and a driver for a burglar, for a burglar. And so when we were there, he never came home to town. We, we were there for, I guess, several months until my father uh, built a house and a little house down at 3240 Quincy which is now where where the Quincy's moved over east to where it was where where now Cleveland Boulevard is north and south there so that was uh, Quincy just east of where the Veterans Hospital there. the vet Veterans Hospital wasn't there then that was all all forest wooded area and he stayed there and he built the house he got, got a job on the WPA uh, and, and the Roosevelt's New Deal and uh, what year exactly do you remember? It had been 1933, 34. And uh, I really don't know how long we stayed with, with, uh, with my dad's sister. But I know it was a, long, a period of time. We got a job, began to build a house I mean, so, with some help. Because I didn't know anybody in Kansas City, but at that time, it was kind of community and people would help you when you were doing something like that. And so uh, we moved into 32, uh, uh, 3421 Quincy. And uh, that house burned down to the ground, and um, uh, we lived in a in a in a, in a barn in the 3400 block of, of Quincy. Lived there for for a couple of weeks or so until my dad found a place to rent. And uh, that this barn was uh, squirrels and, and possums and and uh, bats and all were in, in there. And my so some of the men helped my dad uh, cover it up and arched in plywood. Uh, there in such a way that with that whatever was up there dropping down it would go off. We had all slept together in one bed and we to save the stove from the other place so we had a, a stove, not a, not a cooking stove but a heating stove and I can remember it raining and water just running down just a few feet from both sides of the bed and then my dad found a place to rent and uh, later on a place to buy rent with the option to buy 3240 Quincy uh, and, and then we ended up buying the house, my dad ended up buying the house next door, 3238 Quincy. So that's, the, now I'm about uh, eight or nine years old because I can remember um, when we moved there, we moved into an all white area, poor white area. And after we called each other names and everything, uh, we became friends and we hung out together. Mm -hmm. So uh, eventually uh, you went to public school probably and uh, what were some of the schools that you attended? Well, I attended that. This is pre-1954, Brown versus Board of Education. So I attended Dunbar Elementary School, named after Paul Lawrence Dunbar, African-American writer. 
and then uh, up to the seventh grade. Now, when we moved it to uh, uh, on Quincy in the uh, 3200 block, 3240 Quincy, uh, there was Milton Moore Elementary School just three, two blocks up, up Linwood Boulevard. And of course, I couldn't go there with my white friends. I had to walk about a mile over to Dunbar. And um, they just walked, they, if school started, I don't remember what time, but if summer started at eight o'clock, I had to leave my walking about 7.30, where they didn't have to leave until about five minutes, or 10 minutes till the hour, and walk right up to Mount Memorial Elementary School. In high school, um, I went to I'd catch the streetcar and the bus to, actually the streetcar for, for me, but some of the, the black kids who lived east of us uh, had to catch the bus to come to 31st and Van Brunt at that time, 31st and Hardesty, 31st and Van Brunt, and catch the streetcar to go to either Lincoln High School, 31, uh, 2111 Woodland, the castle on the hill that's, that is called in and still in, and it still is. And then um, I went to R.T. Cole's uh, vocational, middle and vocational uh, high school. And so some of us went to the eighth grade, and, and in one group, they didn't have eighth grade, so it went strictly from the seventh grade to freshman, where there are the, some of us got caught up in that, so we had to go to the eighth grade. So those who were ahead of me, uh, they said that I got caught in the eighth grade, that I was dumb, and that's why they, they were able to skip the eighth grade. <laughs> so I, they probably were right. But um, so, I, I, so I went to both Lincoln High School, took classes there, and I also stayed at, at R.T. Cole's because I wanted to be, they had the best music teacher, the best orchestra, and and, and marching band, and I wanted to be a great musician, play the saxophone and the trombone. And uh, so I stayed, my diploma says R.T. Cole, but my, my academic training, most of it took place at Lincoln High School. And I, so I graduated in 1950. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked about the streetcar uh, that uh, you would catch. Uh, where did that, uh, did it run down uh, 15th Street or uh, Truman Road today? No, the, the streetcar, the end of the line for the 31st streetcar was at 31st and Hardesty, 31st and Van Brunt, okay. Van Brunt and Hardesty, connected yeah. there. In Near the East cemetery Street. area then? No, 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 okay. we, we're, we're on 31st Street. Okay, 31st. On 31st Street. Oh yeah, for the 31st south. Street. And so we could, we, those of us who were, who were going to school, to high school, or, or any place downtown, or, or even to a movie, uh, caught the streetcar there at the, at, at the end of the line and, and went all the way to Vine Street, and then caught the Vine Street car, and it took us down to, to where we get off to go to Lincoln or to go to R.T. Coles, and just made the reverse there. When you went downtown, you caught the 31st streetcar, it went all the way uh, west to Main Street, went north on Main, and and you were downtown there, either you know on the Twelfth Street, it, it, all the the, uh, the chain stores that we call the or the National Macy's and Emberberg Theaters and and Hillsburg and the Palace and Rockshiles, all those stores were downtown, and the infamous uh, store was the was uh, Kresge's, uh, and I say that because it was the only place downtown that uh, maybe I shouldn't say infamous, but it was the only place downtown that that black, black people could, could get a hot dog and a, and a Coke. Okay, could nope. they sit at the counter or at a table? At, at the counter, right off the alley, right off the alley, right inside there. They had, uh, half, I think, half a dozen stools there. And I never shall forget, uh, as a nine or ten year old, my mother was there, and I, I loved those hot dogs and that Coke. I mean, that was the highlight of my life when I went downtown with my mom. And so we were there, and I heard this, this white fellow was standing at the end of the counter, and the white lady was serving us. And he said, uh, do, do you all serve uh, niggers here? And she said, yeah, we serve them here, but they can't eat up there. And uh, so my mother picked up the hot dog and the coconuts. The last time took with her, I went, we went to Crocus, I went, went to Crescent. And I never, I, she never said anything why, but I knew when a white man used that word, Something was wrong because my parents had talked about that, how, how degrading that was, and and what white people would call you as you grew up, and you had to had to 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 take a position, not necessarily a violent position, but let them know when you get old enough that 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 was that, that wasn't who you were. So um, uh, then, when I became about the same age, nine or ten years old. My mother would let me go pay the, the light bill at the Kansas City Power and Light Company, 1330 Baltimore. Mm -hmm. 
a loan, so I, she'd give me a quarter. And although she never took me again to Kresge's, but she allowed me to go because she knew I was downtown and, and how what I felt about that hot dog and that coat. So she gave me a quarter. Sometimes the streetcar, what we call a motorman, is motorman at that time, or conductor. But although you weren't supposed to pay until you get 12 years old, the, he made the black, they make the black kids play a lot of times. So my mother didn't know whether the, it, was a, it was a conductor there that would allow me to get on for free. So she always gave me a, a quarter. A uh, nickel fare either way, uh, each way, if in fact I was forced to pay. And then 15 cents for a 10 cent hot dog and a nickel coat. One day, in my uh, anxiety to get to take that segregated coke and that segregated hot dog. I got off at the wrong stop. I got off rather than at, at 14th in Maine, I got off at 13th in Maine. And up the hill I ran, you know, trying to pay this light bill and then get down to get this coke and this hot dog. And I went into this building where everything had changed. And, and there was two white men who had these uniforms on and a hat and everything. And they came and and grabbed me and began to shuffle me, call me a little black sambo, a little picking in, a little nigger boy and all those kind of things, and rubbing my hair with their knuckles for good luck and all like that. And, and, and white men were all sitting around. Everybody was just so frolic and fun. Just, oh, they were having so much fun. But I, and I'm screaming and hollering and everything. So eventually they took me outside and then picked me up like a, a bale of hay or, or something and was doing it like this. My money went everywhere. And this Caucasian lady drove by. She was going north on Baltimore from 13th. And she said, because I met, found out I was at the Kansas City Club, 1228 Baltimore, all white men's club. And so um, she came by and, and they put me down and she admonished me, what are you doing to this little boy? Why, why are you doing him this way? What did he do? What are you doing? So they laughed, just walked inside and I could see them looking back through the door. And she came with me and she gave me her hat because I was snotting and crying and everything. And she gave me her handkerchief and told me what my nose and you keep it and she said sit in the car and she said what's your name I told her where you live I told her my address she said where are you going I said Kresge's I forgot about KC paying, uh, paying the light bill Kresge she said well what are you doing in there I said well I suppose I suppose to go on to the to the uh, to pay the light bill she said well that's down the road she said but I'm, I said I'm going to Kresge's so I go to Kresge's and just as she joined I said there it is she said well I know where it is so she said hold before you get out your car out the car she reached in her purse and pulled out a quarter. She said, here's a quarter. Well, now I got 40 cents. I got 40 cents worth of hot dogs and, uh, and, and coke. And after I gorged myself and drank myself, I went and got to, to the street corner in the northwest corner of 12th and Main. And I went back home. My mother said, baby, did you pay the light bill? I said, yes, ma'am. Well, you see, I have an IQ of 400 or 500, way up there. I have a lot more sense than anybody else. I put the, it was, it was the ritual that when we paid the light bill. We used the paid part of the light bill. That was a big part. Because when you went in, went into light, power light, you, you'd get, put the money up there. They'd take, the, take your, your, your light bill, put it under this machine, and, and, and it would say zip, zip, and perforate it. Both your part as well as their part. And they give you the big part back. And so, and so, I, I, so what I did, I put the money in. I had, I had all the money. The, the lady helped me pick up my money. And I had all the money, so I put the money and the, and the whole bill back under the scarf on my mother and dad's dresser there. And, uh, and so about two or three weeks later, my mother got a cutoff notice. And she said, baby, did you pay the light bill? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, did they give you a receipt? I said, yes, ma'am. Well, just to show how brilliant I was, I go and I take and cut and tear off this, the, the, the small part, left it there and took the big part back, which was supposed to have been perforated. And she took it and she looked up to the light like that and she did her hand. She said, baby, they didn't, why didn't they mark it paid? I said, mom, it's marked paid. That's my pay. So I said, I can see it. She said, no, no. So I broke down and started crying. I told her what happened. And it's interesting, out of my younger life when these things happened to me by white folks, my mother never gave a blanket statement about white folks are evil or bad and this kind of thing. But she did tell me that in life, baby, those kind of things are going to happen to you because you are black and they're white. But she also said to me, come on, sit here. And so I would, she had this old lime green rocking chair. 
Well, she sat and rocked and read the paper, and, um, and we did take the daily paper and read the Bible. And she, when things like this had happened, and this was the first time that this had happened, that I brought it home to her. It happened before, but I never said anything. And she said, get, and she had me to get out on my knees, and she put the left side of my head in her lap. And she patted me on the right side. And she'd read a little bit from the Bible and sing a little bit of Precious Lord, one of the old black spirituals. Precious Lord, take my hand. And she'd pray this prayer. And I can hear her now. She'd say, God, help my baby to become the kind of man that you want him to be. And I, I hear my mother saying that so often, so often. And I really didn't know what she meant except I'd been introduced to God and Jesus through her, although she never attended church. She was a very spiritual woman, a religious woman. And I, how many times after that that things happened to me, misused by police. When we moved in the area, there was a velvet freeze at 31st in Indiana. We moved into the area and became, I became friends with my white peers. They would tell me about, you could go up the velvet freeze and get this big double dip of, of ice cream cone for a nickel. And so you could hunt around the community where people threw pop bottles. At that time, you could take pop bottles and take them to the store and get two cents. And so they had me, all those kind of scavenging around and everything. So I would go up, the first time I went up to the Belfast Freeze with them, there were five of us. Tommy Finley was the oldest. He was two years old. I was, I think I was Bobby Jones, Billy Jones, Bobby Jones. There were three Jones boys and another kid who was Italian. Anthony, I never knew Anthony, I can't remember Anthony's last name. Tony, call him Tony. And we were all going in together. And a young girl who was direct there came out and said, you can't come in here. And I said, why? She said, you just can't come in here. You can't come in here. And so she stood there, and my friends had already gone in. And she said, you tell them what you want. So I said, I want a, a vanilla and a strawberry ice cream cone. So I gave them my money. So I had to wait outside till they come out. And on that incident, I never told my mother about what had happened. But several incidents with the police. I was still that nine or ten years old, and our neighbors, one of our neighbors, we lived at 3240 Quincy, and the other 3230 to 3240 Brighton was a street right over. But our houses, you could see, if it was in, if it wasn't in, in the springtime, where the trees were with leaves and all, you could just see my house, just a throwaway. And uh, we were out looking for that money to go buy ice cream cone. And the police picked us up, Linwood and, and Jackson. We had our money, but the police picked us up and put us in the car. All five of us piled up in the back of the car. Well, we could tell from the f older officer who was who was, I always use the expression, I looked like he was about 14 months pregnant. And he'd been drinking. And he took us back and lined us up against the car and the lady came out, the daughter came out and said, oh no, that's not, that's not the boys. What happened is some boys, all white, had been throwing at her dog in the backyard, the family dog in the backyard, and her baby was back in the playpen. And she came out and admonished them and said, you're gonna hit my baby, stop that, stop it. And so they cursed out and everything, and she called the police. Well, they picked us up, the police did. And she said, oh no, that's not, that's not them, no, that's not them at all. She said, no, that's not, I know Alvin said, he goes to the store for my, my parents to get a prescription because my, my, uh, my brother is bedridden and needs, needs uh, medication, so they give him money to go down to the drugstore to get a prescription. So after that, we decided to walk off, go to my house. My mother fed everybody, all the kids, not only the four that was with me, Tommy and, and Billy and Bobby, Tony, 
but also any other kids that we met. They word got around that Miss Brooks will feed you peanut butter and jelly or lunch meat and jelly and, and this kind of thing. So we were on the way over there, and the, this one officer said, get back in the car. And so I said, well, I'll leave it. I said, get back in the car. So we got back in the car, and they drove us, he drove us around. It was a younger white officer was driving the car. And he, this one officer said, said, you have, although you're a white trash, you know, have no business with this nigger. You have no business with this nigger. And he said, he's our friend. He said, he can't be your friend because he's a nigger. He can't be your friend. So they drove around and drove around and finally ended up at the bottom of the Brighton Hill, which were 32nd Street and Linwood. It's a Y straight. It's 32nd and to the left is Linwood Boulevard. And they were at the bottom of the, of the Brighton Hill at 3200 block. So we got out the car. So we all got out. And he said, you hold on here. And so he pulled out his gun, and he cocked it. He said, okay, you're a, little, you're a little black nigga ass. If you can make it over the top of that hill before I shoot your black ass, you're a free nigga. You can get to running, nigga, get to running. So I'm running and screaming back, because I'm like, please don't shoot me. He had his gun, and it was cocked. And we, they was hollering, screaming, don't shoot Alvin, don't shoot Alvin. And Billy, who was the baby of the group, about six or seven years old, jumped up on his arm, and the gun went off. And we just ran. I was running backwards as, as fast as they were as far. When we got up to the top of the hill, we were laughing, you know, this, we were laughing. So any time we thought we was in trouble, we'd find a piece of glass and we'd prick our fingers. And we were blood brothers, you know. And I often wonder whether any of my four white friends know that they've got some black blood in them, you know, on the DNA. But anyway, I don't, I don't know where they are. But um, we were saying, we did that because we were not going to tell anyone. Billy disappeared. He went and told my mom. And my mother's calling. Alvin, Alvin, and Alvin is awake there. What's this about the police officer shooting you? And the, and the, and the, uh, we were saying, the police officer didn't shoot you. No, he didn't shoot you. And Billy said, yes, he did. Yes, he did. So my mother called the police station, or the dispatcher, whoever. And the police sergeant came out. He never got out the car. My mother went up to the window and, so what happened, so he called each one of us. We sat in the back, so he called me in and read on down. And so when he got, he never took out a pen and paper, never took out anything. He told me, well, we're going to investigate this and we'll get back to you. Well, that was probably about 1942, 41 or 42, and my mother's gone on to glory, and I suspect he, he is too, and, and most of my friends, and he never got back to us. And that was just one of the incidents, along with the cancer of the club, the velvet freeze, incident with the police, but numerous other cases. And even after I got uh, uh, a teenager, incidents happened. And, and when, I, when I told my dad, I, first I said to my wife, 21 years old and three kids, and I said, I, I told my wife, I think I want to go in the police department. She said, why do you want to go in the police department? I said, I don't know. I just, I think I want to be a cop. She said, well, if, it, if that's what you want to do, uh, okay, I, you know. Okay, I'll, I'll support you. She said, have you said anything to your dad? I said, no, not yet. So she said, well, you got to talk to your dad. So uh, I called him. He, he was quite a drinker. In fact, that's what took him away from me, his fluorosis of the liver. And I, when I, I called him sober, and I said, Dad, you know, I've been thinking about going to the police and some of that police. And I said, I think about joining, and he said, the police, he said, what? He said, boy, why do you want to get in that mess? You know how they treat us. You've had enough experience of that. And I said, Dad, I just I think I just I want to go. I think I can make a difference. You can't make no difference in that racist. He didn't use the word racist in a discriminatory uh, uh, police department and how they treat us. But anyway, he didn't know that I already filled out the papers and I was scheduled to get taken the exam, was scheduled to take going to the police department. They wanted me to go in January of fifty four. But I wanted to finish my second year of, uh, of junior college and get my AA degree and, and got into class of June 1 of 54. And that's how I got into the police department. That's kind of building up to marriage young and joining the police department.